this video might be seen as an extension of my World War III videos, but I think that I am probably going to start moving away from labeling these videos as World War III, primarily because people seem to be misunderstanding, or perhaps this is loaded. People might think that I am trying to talk about or lure them in with the idea of some sort of fear that we're going to have some massive conflagration, perhaps even something like a nuclear war or something like that. I would encourage you to go back and look at at least the first video in this series. That's not what I'm talking about here. And I don't think that we are facing anything like that. The war that we are inside of, and again, we are inside of it, and it's clearly not a nuclear war. It is not even a huge military conflict, although we are going to see some military aspects in what's happening. But this is a different kind of a war because we're in a different kind of an age. We're in the age of the merchant. We're in the age of economics. We're in the age of finance. And if you pay attention and you look and you really know what you're looking for, you will see that actually warfare is being waged and it's primarily economic warfare. That doesn't mean that it doesn't do damage. It does incredible damage. That doesn't mean that it can't contribute to suffering and even death. Absolutely. Uh, and the economy of a country going sideways, it can be the cause of a lot of suffering for people. You can see people displaced economically. You have economic refugees. This is something that happens in the same way that you have refugees from war. So I think that it is important to begin in that vein. If I'm using the term World War III, I am discussing this conflict that is happening. And as I have said, the conflict that we're talking about might be characterized as something like a currency war. But today, what I want to talk about is maybe drawing it out into a much larger picture. And that much larger picture is the idea of the new world order. And what does that mean? People say it. It's on the back of the dollar bill, the $1 bill, famously under the all-seeing eye and the pyramid. The words around it, translated from Latin, say he has blessed our undertaking, the new order of the ages, novus ordo seclorum, which can also be translated as new world order. And we talked about world and age and the relationship of those two ideas in the last video in this series. And now I want to talk about what this is shaping up to look like. And really, I think that what we could see is there is a overall world order, and then there are individual orders that make up that world order. What we have had, certainly since the fall of the Soviet Union, is we have had a sole superpower. So we have had what you would call a hegemon. And that hegemon has been the United States. And part of that hegemony has been the petrodollar. It has been a single currency, the US dollar, that on the open international market is fundamentally the only currency that you can use to buy oil. So the most cru crucial energy resource for the world, if you want to purchase it on the open market as a nation, uh, some major entity, you're going to have to do that in dollars up until now that order is changing. So the petrodollar was the world order fundamentally. It meant that every nation on earth needed to acquire US dollars. So they needed to have US dollar reserves if they wanted to ensure their energy security and be able to participate in the world economy. That's being broken apart, as we can see. That's actually the big story bigger than any of the military, uh, what would you call it, distraction that's happening on the ground in Ukraine is the effect that is that the sanctions on Russia in this particular case are having in creating new energy related currencies. So this is the gas for rubles. When this was announced by Vladimir Putin, those paying attention understood that really this was meant to be sort of an answer to the petrodollar. So before you want to buy oil, you got to buy it in US dollars. In this case, we make the gas, you need the gas. 
and you have the pipelines going into your country. So it's even different than oil, which might be shipped on tankers or something. Um, if you want, if you don't want that pipeline to turn off, you're going to need to pay us in rubles. And they have a very sort of interesting way that they've come around to doing that, but it drives a demand for rubles. And and this has not been covered heavily in the English speaking media, there is an organization that is called the Your Asian Economic the Eurasian Economic Council or the Eurasian Economic Association. And they are putting together a currency. This is China and Russia are the big members, but also you have members like Serbia, for instance. And they are putting together a new digital currency to use in between each other, to settle in between each other. Those same sorts of things are happening in the West as well. And that's when we get to this new world order. What does the new world order look like? Some people might use the term multipolar. So that means we may be, and it looks as though we are moving away from absolutely it's the do US dollar. It may be several different other currencies, but we will see these orders split apart. So you may have this Eurasian type of order where Russia and China are there. And then you, you will have the west what we've been seeing the collective west maybe we see a move from africa in that regard maybe africa tries to play a role what is lost in this i think for many people and what i will try to explain what i've certainly spoken about with certain private groups that i'm a part of is in seeing that this new world order is approaching us it is it is definitely on the horizon can we play a role is there a role to be played? And I believe that indeed there is. And indeed there is a role for a second, third, fourth, whatever it is, smaller order while they're building these other economic orders, one to start to be built at a very grassroots level by people who are of like mind and ethical values around Bitcoin. And that fundamentally, that's really what these systems are for. They're global value transfer networks. And when you understand them that way, as opposed to, and it's a protocol, when you understand it as the protocol for doing this, as opposed to a particular network where I'm going to acquire some of this value, and then I'm the value of it will go up relative to these other currencies, number go up, speculation, whatever. When you view it in the vein of a, a protocol that is a value transfer network that is permissionless, that is available to anyone to use, it starts to take on a whole new character. Somebody had mentioned that in uh, my last video that I had mentioned Bitcoin Mystery School, the school that I... Uh, founded and for which I'm an instructor that I had mentioned it several times and they said, oh, well, why, what's that all about? And a lot of the insights on this have really come from me being involved with the school and teaching dozens of students, brand new students every single month. And then including the students who have learned in the first class and who have completed the first class, taking many of them who have no coding background into the second set of courses and then them actually learning how to code their own wallet and starting, then it really starts to open up and to see what is this thing? Because they're actually like close to the metal building and it becomes more a part of them. It's not separated from them. That's when these insights have really started to come. Uh, over this last week, we had our final week of our wallet course. And as we are finishing that final day and constructing the transaction and they're actually broadcasting it onto the blockchain and seeing what it is. One of the students said, oh, this is a, I get it now. This is about self-sufficiency. This is something like planting your own food, having backyard chickens, generating your own electricity with solar power. That's what this is. Whereas, yes, there's an entire food network, isn't there? There's an entire network and supply chain whereby you can get food and you can go to the grocery store, but there's something qualitatively different about me eating the tomatoes that grew there or the bananas, as it were, that I'm looking at on my banana trees here. 
of me eating those bananas or a store-bought banana. There's an entire set of consequences, things that change. The nature of food security changes when it's you who's creating all of your food. And it's the same thing that the nature of money, your understanding of money and the economic system changes when you are able to participate and do all of the things that the financial powers are doing. Because there is an open, common protocol that people are using. So the ability even to innovate, to do things that just simply can't be done in the established financial network. That's what this is about. That's what we have the opportunity to build on top of. And then it also starts to make sense as to why it would be worth it to expend energy on proof of work. It certainly isn't worth it if it's just number go up, right? If what, I just buy it on an exchange and I sit on it and I wait until the price changes and then I sell it back for fiat. Why do we have all these computers running? We don't need that. Yeah, let's move to proof of stake or any of these things that they say right? Oh, why are we eating up? Why are we spending all of this for the carbon? But change that around. Why are we expending all of this electricity? Well, for generations and generations to have a, an opportunity and a choice to say, yeah, that economic model that you're using, that monetary system, that, that financial establishment, that's not working for our country, our community, our family. We're going to use something different and we're going to build it ourselves and we can build it ourselves because it's open and no one can stop us from accessing it. That's something completely different. The unfortunate part about it is there are so few people building toward that. First off, it can be incredibly profitable to do. I mean, it's a business and it's solving people's problems and also rewarding when you solve those problems. And I've had several of those types of experiences where it was truly, truly rewarding from being able to uh, use my company Cointex to text funds to Rohingya refugees uh, in Bangladesh that they could use to then uh, purchase things at the store in their refugee camp to now the systems that I've built enabling fundamentally uh, cannabis retailers here in CNMI to be able to accept PayPal and credit cards, where they're not able to do that because cannabis is a schedule one drug and payment processors deny them directly, but with the crypto bridge, we're able to do it. And that's, and people look at this, this is fantastic. You've solved my problems. You saw, you've, you've helped me to get over some of these hurdles that are there. So we have an opportunity if we decide that we're going to build at the same time in parallel, well, there's a sense of urgency, but if we decide that we're going to build in parallel, our new world order, what do we want the world to look like? And it isn't just, it's not going to happen if all you're doing is you're just buying, holding. It's not osmosis, it's not magic we actually have to decide what do we want the world to look like financially and then go ahead and do the building. So I'm glad and I have learned a, a ton myself and what we're looking at has become much more clear as I have taught students over the last year and a half. A lot of insights come from students asking fantastic questions and me really having, having to think about the question that they're asking to ask it to myself and to explore. Many insights have come that way. And so what are we doing? We're building up, trying to build up, I think successfully so far, building up a cadre of people who, because they have worked close to the metal, because they have not only gotten the high level explanation of what is this system really about, but they're actually able to get in and build their own wallets and see, oh, that's how a transaction is formed. Oh, that's all that it is? Oh, this is simple but powerful. And to get some coding skills while they're at it and some of them to even take it further. So that's, that's what 
we need to be doing. That's if we want a new world order that is of our choosing and not just the one that's going to be forced onto everybody. We have to start building. But there's a great amount of hope. I'm very hopeful because we can do it, because it is here, because we've been gifted with this fantastic tool out of nowhere. And who would have ever imagined that it would be ready for us right when we need it? But we've got to take advantage of it. We've got to build. If you want to join us in doing that building, I would love to, I would love to have you, bitcoinmysteryschool.com. The novice initiation course, you can sign up for that. The, after that, you can take the wallet apprentice course. And after that, there's even an additional challenge that will give you the opportunity to work right alongside with me on the projects that I'm doing. Would love to see you there. Any questions that you have about that, I'm happy to answer. And I will continue with this, this series talking about the types of things that we can build and the types of ideas, maybe offering a vision of the, the, different, the different things that we could do and how different our new world order could be from the one that we currently see. So I'm looking forward to that and I will talk to you soon.